responses. And I'm also going to try and bring in one or two of the questions from the floor um, to try and do both of my responsibilities. Um, perhaps I might actually ask Tessa Zhao, um, in light of what's happened here and in response to a question from Aeroni Ripa-Demina from the LSE, um, perhaps you could reflect a little bit on the mechanisms that triggered the demand of a strong London government after all that time with, with no mayor. And from those mechanisms, do you think there's some lessons that might be transferable to Mumbai? Well, I think that the, uh, one of the great political battles and sort of defining political battles in London of the 80s was the abolition of the Greater London Council. So, uh, you know, London uh, was, is a city that had had its own government. Its own government was uh, wound up and it became, as I say, became one of the, um, the great cause celebre for progressives to fight the abolition of, um, of London's government. So in a sense, the, um, the existence of London government was in the recent memory of um, you know, the, the progressive center left who, um, and you know, it, was, it was a major commitment um, following our re-election in 19, or our election in 1997 to restore London government. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the kind of democratic argument is probably, um, from London's point of view, the most powerful, but that was also linked to very strong voices from business about the, uh, the benefit of um, the clear leadership of elected government in order to promote business confidence. Um, if I could ask our respondents to keep their remarks relatively um, uh, brief, um, could I actually ask Ashok Bal, who's the Deputy Chairman of the Mumbai Port Trust, to reflect on what we've heard this morning? Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Mr. Korea, in his presentation, referred Mumbai City. Mr. Bal. Mr. Korea, in his presentation, referred Mumbai city as started as a port town. Mr. Cyrus Gazdar, he wants a city without port because he wants the docklands to be relocated and released for city's alternative use. I would like to offer my observations on these comments. Uh, as you may be aware, the Mumbai city, or sorry, Mumbai port, as an organized entity, came into being in 1873, although this port was in existence since Portuguese times. So the port and the city form an integral part of the city's history and legacy. The port is an inseparable part of city's identity, character, and history. And this inclusive identity needs to be preserved and protected. The historical link of the port from the city cannot be severed. Second, there appears to be a perception in some quarters that the old port of Mumbai is declining or it has no future. This perception is far from the truth. Today, this port is the fastest growing major port in the country. In fact, it has recorded a very strong sustained increase in traffic for the last several years. From 26 million tons in 2002-03, it doubled to 52 million tons in 6-7, and it is set to achieve 60 million tons during the current fiscal. And I'd like to emphasize that this steady increase in traffic is associated with rapid decline of its hinterland. You know, after 96, when the port sector was thrown open to the private sector participation, you know, many ports and terminals came up on the West Coast. As a result, the hinterland of Mumbai port, which was at one time extended up to North India, Central India, and Western India, has rapidly shrunk, and today it is limited to Mumbai city and its adjoining areas. And let me be 
on record to say that the 95% of the cargo that is handled by Mumbai port is either originating from or destined to Mumbai region and its surrounding areas. 76% of the cargo is captive to the Mumbai port. Therefore, this underscores the locational necessity of the port for this region. And any forced displacement of a major economic activity like Mumbai port will be very counterproductive and detrimental to the interest of the port. Having said that, see now we are talking about the eastern water, you know there are references about the eastern water development. Yes, Mumbai port occupies a part of the eastern waterfront and we need to understand the unique character of the eastern waterfront which is a part of the Mumbai harbor. Enclosed by the mainland on one side and the island on the other side, it provides a very safe, natural, sheltered and protected harbor, unique of its kind in the world and which is eminently suitable for development of port and shipping activities. See, we are talking, you know, when you talk about this uh, uh, Bombay Mr. port, Bell, can I perhaps I'll take a minute, I'll take a minute. Up. When you talk about the Bombay port, we talk about its landed estates. Yes, it's a landed estates which are not meant for the port's operational areas are need to be redeveloped and there is no true opinion about that. But then it has to keep in mind a recent judgment of the Supreme Court which protects the tenants and it need, needs to take into account the interest of the tenants. And uh, as far as the landed estate is concerned, we have a business plan in place which provides for putting land for public use. Mainly, as Mr. Korea was referring to, the passenger water transport between Mumbai city and the different locations across the harbor. We plan to have a cruise terminal. We want to develop marina. We have provided a project for running short of social time, housing. Please. Thank you. Suketu Mesa. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of observations in hearing uh, the excellent panelists, and uh, I liked uh, um, the presentations they made about the future of the city. Now, I think it occurs to me, uh, and I'm a writer, so my task is to communicate. It occurs to me that the eventual plans for what can save Mumbai uh, are known to most people. As in the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, which seems forever intractable, the eventual terms of a settlement are known to most people. We need things like a directly elected mayor and some kind of uh, the shifting of the role of the Port Trust. Uh, we need more public transport uh, to disperse some of the population across the harbor. The problem is in how to communicate this to the vast majority of the people that live in this city that don't speak our language, literally or figuratively. They have no voice in what we deliberate in rooms like this but they do have the vote. And this is where all our plans or visions or hallucinations uh, come up against the reality of a population which in the slum areas votes at the rate of some 90% and a population in precincts like this in South Bombay which stays aloof from politics on the ground. We don't vote and by and large we don't participate in the political process. And the difference between the world's two great democracies, India and the US, is that in India, the poor vote. So in order for any kind of improvement um, to be made viable, we need to communicate our plans to the majority of the people of this city. And I don't see that being done. The second observation um, I'd like to make is that unless we fix the problems of the villages, we're not going to fix the problems of the cities. Rahul Mehrotra once said to me, we have a problem as planners in cities like Mumbai. The nicer we make this city, the more roads, the more buildings we build, the more public transport, the more the number of people that will want to come and live here. So unless agriculture is made viable again uh, in the countryside, unless you can keep them down on the farm, I don't see long-term sustained solutions 
to the problems of cities like Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Narendra Naya, <laughs> Director of Bombay First. Thank you. For me personally, it's a great, uh, a great satisfaction to participate in this conference here today, organized by Urban Age, to dealing with the city of Mumbai. Sanjay referred to a vision which was prepared four years ago, and I, from Bombay First, was particularly happy and in a way to be associated with preparation of that vision. It was actually four years ago when we said that the city was decaying, everybody realized a vision had to be prepared and a document which was prepared, which I think Andy showed on his slide uh, earlier on this. So what have we achieved in the last three or four years? I think one thing, matter of great satisfaction, there is a great awareness now with the NGOs, with the people, the citizens, that something needs to be done with the city. Media, if you open a newspaper every morning, there's a reference to what is happening in the city, city needs to be done. A public-private partnership has been created for the first time in, in, to deal with the governance of the city. There is a public, you know, the citizen action group constituted by the government of Maharashtra, where 30 citizens of the city sit with the government uh, and the Empowered Committee would sit with the government to see how the city's various initiatives could be uh, monitored. We have launched a largest, I think, an urban renewal program. There's going to be an investment of something like 50 to $60 billion taking place in, in the city here in the next 10 years. That, I think, is a very, very uh, important step. Now, what are the constraints? I think, very, what, I think the minister referred to that, the, you know, one, there has to be courage and there has to be boldness. And that, I think, is what <coughs> we require here. Our, our city development will not take place without the political leaders supporting it, and they have to have courage and boldness. That, I think, is very, very important that we need. A vision, a lot of people talk about vision. Vision is very important. We need to have a vision, and we do have a vision for the city, which has been Sanjay very... Uh, aptly point, pointed out, showed us what the vision is. And if all those things happen in the next 10 years, this, this will be a really a world-class, can be a world-class global city. Now, what are the constraints that we've got here? We have a land use. This, this, it's, a, it's a port, it's a port city, it's, a, it's an island city, there's a land use. We talk about the port land, I will not get into a debate on that. that, that but I think there could be a win-win situation for the port and the city. A lot, lot of... Uh, country, a lot of cities around the world, a lot of not a country, the ports were there, and they have given part of the land to the city. London is an example in itself. Where, so it doesn't Brief, mean that the briefly, port should please. close. Sorry. All right. Then the transport has been referred to several people. Now, that's true. We have neglected our transport. We are carrying on 21st century and the 19th century, 19th century transport structure that was built out there. Migration is a very big problem. You, you have two to 300,000 people coming into the city, living in slums, why the slums? So there it needs to be tackled. We need to find a way how we can stop that, how we can deal with that. But one of the things the government policies, policies adopted a few years ago, if you tell, let it be known around the world, around the country, that if you come to Bombay, you'll get, if you live in Nepal, you'll have a place, you'll get a free housing. Uh, so that doesn't, that's not going to help out. The other biggest thing is the, is the issue here is the planning. There has been no proper planning in the city for the in, for development in the city. So we need to have a proper planning authority, proper planning, a holistic plan like the London plan. Which is a great uh, end note to end on, I think. Th sorry? Th thank you, Mr. Nair. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. All right. but, uh, that one that last point I'd like to say is because we're looking at an investment of $60 billion. We, we need to have a proper implementation <laughs> mechanism in place. <laughs> if that is not placed, our record of implementation has not been very good. So, thank thank you. Um, the last word was to have been with uh, Sheila Patel, but unfortunately she can't be with us. So Sunda Bura has stepped in at um, very short notice to have the last, and I'm sure, very brief word. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to say one thing, that uh, I think the direction Mumbai will take will depend uh, crucially upon... Uh, whether we believe in participatory democracy or not. Because I think, uh, you know, what people have been referring to, how do you uh, 
involve the poor? How do you listen to the voices of the poor? Recently, for example, the government, for reasons unclear, has said that slum redevelopment projects do not need the consent of the people, uh, particularly certain types of large government-owned, uh, government-managed projects. So to us, this seems sort of profoundly undemocratic. How can you decide uh, what is good for the people without consulting them? So I think public debate, transparency, a kind of discourse model of democracy which <coughs> involve the poor, uh, to us, uh, our organization which works with the urban poor, we feel that uh, this is really a key element. Thank you. Thank you for such. Um, thank you for a ringing conclusion to this morning's conversation.